Hello uh, and welcome to the Oxford Blue in conversation with Waspy Kani. My name is Alana Rades and I'm an interviews editor for the Blue. Today I'm joined by Waspy. Uh, Waspy is CEO and founder of Grange Park Opera and Pimlico Opera. She grew up in West London, her parents having fled India at partition. She played violin for the National Youth Orchestra and studied music at our very own St Hilda's. On graduating from Oxford, Waspy spent 10 years programming and designing financial computer systems in the city, and in 1986 started her own small computer consultancy, which gave her the flexibility to spend more time conducting. In 1987, Waspy founded Pimlico Opera and so began her distinguished career in the sphere. Pimlico Opera was the first opera company to specialize in performing in unusual places, such as hospitals and prisons. Just before the first lockdown last year, Pimlico Opera put on a performance at HMP Bronzefield, its 28th collaboration, and has brought more than 60,000 members of the public into prisons to watch the incredible performances. In 1992, Waspy was made chief executive of Garsington Opera, more than quadrupling its turnover in her five years tenure there. And in 1997, Waspy founded Grange Park Opera, which now lives at West Horsley Place, in the grounds of which Waspy created, from scratch, Theatre in the Woods, a 700-seat opera house based on La Scala, and the UK's first new opera house to be built in the 21st century. Waspy is also an honorary fellow of the Royal Institute of British Architects and of St Ilda's. It's lovely to have you, Waspy. Well, there are two things that are wrong with that. <laughs> you obviously were reading a speech. One is that I was, we lived in East London. West London's posh. East London is where all the immigrants go. Because in those days, you got off a boat and that's where the boat was. Anyway, so, yeah. so I, I was brought up in East London, not West London. Mm, I think uh, that's slightly sort of vain thing to pick up on. And the other is that I don't regard myself as remotely distinguished. <laughs> well, I do. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, I, don't... I, I apologize about the West East London <laughs> confusion. That is, I think most people, regardless of which side, consider that quite an important distinction. Um, so obviously you are an expert on opera. Uh, and my first question for you is how would you convey the beauty of opera to someone who's never experienced it? Well, I think opera's got a bad name for itself because there's this hideous phrase called an opera buff. I don't know who invented it, but they need to be taken out and shot. <laughs> I don't regard myself as an opera buff. I say, I know a bit about opera. You know, somebody else might know some other bits. We all know different bits. But really what opera is about is it has to be done as a group. So you go into a theatre, you sit in your seat, and there are other people all around you and the narrative unfolds with music and there's always surtitles so you always know what the story is and as the narrative unfolds you just follow the story and you have a lot of feelings that's what it's all about it's all about your feelings now Alana your feelings won't be the same as my feelings but no one's right and no one's wrong now, having those feelings, and then the person next door to you, who you've never met before, um, have their feelings. I think this whole collection of people having a load of feelings is what it's all about. Yeah. And you don't, you don't have to identify with, I don't know, um, Mimi, who's dying of whatever she dies of. You don't have to identify with individuals. You just have to feel something about situations, about um, you know, the chemistry between two people, all these things it's opera is all about feelings now tell me to shut up if it's getting boring already but when you look at a picture you have a load of feelings or maybe you don't have a load of feelings when you have more feelings you think it's a great picture so it's all about feelings and the more you know about your feelings it informs your humanity this is what makes you a human yeah. It's all to do with understanding these feelings and then deploying them to be a useful member of society. That was a big leap, wasn't it? <laughs> I mean, yes, but I, I understand what you mean. Um, there's a lot that we can learn just from experiencing something in an auditorium with a lot of people and take it out into real life. Um, yeah. So you, you mentioned there... Can I ask you a question, Alana? Yes, absolutely. You use this phrase, real life. Tell me about pretend life. 
Uh, Surely all of life is real, even if you're pretending. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Yeah, I, I would I would classify my tutorials as real life, even when I'm faking my way through them. <laughs> um, it it's real in that moment. It might be wrong, yeah. but it's real. <laughs> uh, so you talked about, you mentioned opera buff there. There's a similar thing with classics, which is what I study. Um, what would you say to someone who thinks that opera isn't for them? Uh, I'd ask them why they say that. You know, they're obviously, it's obviously comes from somewhere inside them, from some feeling. So I try to figure out what the feeling is and then attack that feeling, not attack it, but <laughs> you know, just talk, talk to that feeling. Yeah. So when you say, when people say to you, classics isn't for them um i you know my favorite place in the world probably is rome and it's purely because of its classical past you know mm -hmm. i love i love all the renaissance stuff and all the rest of it but i really just could spend my entire life going into the um three stories down in san clemente san clemente where you can walk in a roman street or have you been to there have you been there I was in Rome for 36 hours, so I've, I've seen as much as possible, but not Well, always. you're very young. I'm 65. I've, ha I've had to get a bit more in before than you. So for the same reason, you know, what, what would you say about if somebody said to you, classics isn't for them or, if, or, you know, the ancient world is of no interest to them? What would you say? Well, I think similarly, probably classics and opera similarly have a bit of a perception problem. So I would say, um, you know, what's something that interests you, whether that's social politics or military history, and say, right, well, here's an example of the classical world. You find this interesting, don't you? Right, well, you're a classicist. Yeah, yeah. Maybe the word classicist is putting people off. I mean, you're interested, yeah. in, you're interested in the ancient world. Yes, Ooh. everything can be found in the ancient world. I totally agree. And everything can be found in opera. You know, name a situation, and it probably is replicated at some point in an opera, obliquely or not so obliquely. A um, bit of a, a direction change here, but could you tell me something about the person who introduced you to music? Um, so, so my family, are all Indian, so they had no experience of Western music at all. And when I was in my primary school in East London, not West London, <laughs> when I was in my primary school in East London, I um, I remember, so I must have been less than six because I was still in the East End. And I remember at one point seeing in the headmistress's room, there was a violin case and I just thought, there's something about that violin case that bewitched me. I didn't even know what was inside the violin case, but I, we did have teachers in the school who would play the piano and we'd sing. So this whole thing about musical instruments, I think is where it started. Um, then the most, I then started playing the piano for myself without a teacher. And then when I went to my secondary school in those days, everyone could get free music lessons and so I got proper piano lessons for the first time and my piano teacher there was called Gillian Stacy, and she's just died um, oh, um you know she's even older than me so eventually we all have to die um so she was a huge influence on me and you know and that was the beginning of my love of playing the piano and playing the violin uh, if you had to pick between the piano and the violin which would you pick Oh, that's a bit of a silly question. Anna. <laughs> it's like saying you have to pick between an apple and a pear. Well, I eat an apple every day because I'm trying to become thinner and not too ugly. But I don't eat a pear every day because pears are difficult to come by to get them ripe. So, but, you know, of course, a juicy pear is, I don't know. I don't have a piano. I don't have a preference. You know, piano is much easier because you just sit down and play it. Whereas the violin, you have to unzip the case and then you have to tune it and then you have to put rods in on the bow. It's all a bit of a palaver. I, I, I pick an apple. I'm not a huge pear fan myself. Oh, um, you've never tasted a ripe pear. <laughs> I think, so you've got this to learn about pears. You've never um, tasted a perfectly ripe pear. Not what Marks and Spencer call a perfectly ripe pear, a proper ripe pear. Now the trouble with pears, is that you know you pick them in about sort of September or whatever, and then they're not ripe, and then you have to write. You can write. You ripen them off the tree, and they're probably perfect for about twenty four hours. So you have to sit with your pear, watch <laughs> it, 
So yes, it's the moment to eat it. Um, well, again, very different to pears, but um, as you mentioned, you're in your 60s and I wanted to know what music has meant to you at different times in your life. Well, it, it's a nice question. It's a nice question. Oddly, as I've, at the beginning, in my even in my 40s, music was like kind of work. I don't know why. When I was running Garsington, music was like work. It was a lot of stress. But as I got older, I think it's, you know, I talk about these feelings. I think maybe as you get older, because you know people who've died and you know all these problems you have with in the world. So maybe as you get older, it speaks to you more. And I used to hate just having you know, music going on in the background. But now my idea of bliss is, uh, I, uh, there's a wonderful pianist called Arthur Bre Alfred Brendel. And Alfred Brendel's complete Beethoven piano sonatas. They're all on YouTube. It's a 10 hour stretch and I put them on and I love listening to them. I just love, I love it more and more. And I think maybe oh, that's what happens to opera as well. That as you get older, you like it more because a lot of it is about death. You know, the big climax of an opera usually involves a woman dying. <laughs> now, interestingly, I don't know whether this is remotely interesting to your customers, but um, interestingly, English National Opera has said that they find Madame Butterfly. Do you know the story of Madame Butterfly? Vaguely? Um, Google it. Yeah. Um, I won't waste your time. Um, a woman dies. They said they find the story so offensive to women that they're never going to put on this Puccini opera ever again. And then I thought, if you're not going to put on that one, what about all the other ones where a woman <laughs> dies? Because most operas, a woman dies. Usually of my four operas that I'm putting on in a year, most of the, if they're the comedies, they don't die. <laughs> in all the rest of them, a woman dies. Huh. I, I did not know that. Um... Okay, well, we've we've talked a little bit about opera in general, um, and I mentioned when I introduced you your work with Pimlico Opera in prisons, for which you were honoured um, with your CBE. Uh, oh, no, you got it wrong. It's OBE. I got an OBE years ago because I'd spent so much time in prison. <laughs> um, I mean, now I've got a CBE because I think because I just stuck at everything for so long. But uh, what I say, Alana, is we're all the same. And, you know, probably none of these awards are mine. They're all to be shared. And we're all the same anyway. Um, well, <laughs> my question is, it, it, it's quite broad, but wh why prisons? What led you to, to prisons? So I went to a school behind Wormwood Scrubs. And when I'd started doing, this is in the late 1980s. So I'd left um, St Hilda's in 1978. I'd done a shed load of computer programmes and worked very, very hard. And then um, I, I was doing, you know, Coots Bank, the Queen's Bankers, they booked us to do an opera and we were doing operas in all kinds of places. And I thought, I know, a prison. So I wrote, of course, pre email dateies, um, I wrote to the governor of Wormwood Scrubs Prison. And I was very surprised that uh, he rang me up. <laughs> <laughs> and said yes this sounds like a great idea and I went to see him and so we did the first thing we did is all we did is we performed to uh the chapel full of prisoners I pro probably formed to about 500 prisoners and then and then my next thing was to do joint collaborations where the prisoners actually participate and we put them through a four-week full-time rehearsal period as we do normal singers and uh, and then we do some performances at the end and then this gives me the opportunity to tell you one of my many many prison stories some of which don't involve a swear word <laughs> <laughs> not many i imagine not many not many so often in the second week of rehearsal in i don't actually participate in the rehearsals i just go in i'm like the government inspector these days um in those days i used to actually help take the rehearsals as a musician and the in the second week we kind of re-rehearse act one scene three and we'd start doing it and one of the prisoners would say but miss we did that last week and i said if you had rehearsed your armed robbery you wouldn't be in prison <laughs> it's all in the rehearsal um, fortunately they got the they, they got the message yeah. that is the message you gotta yeah. rehearse 
Um, well, so obviously, uh, HMP Bronzefield just just before lockdown um, last year was your twenty eighth prison collaboration, and I'm sure you've got so many stories. But what would you say is the most all the swear uh, words <laughs> with all the swear words, which you can say, by the way, um, oh, really? you can. Uh, I'm take away my honorary fellowship from some <laughs> the bad um, behavior <laughs> well i would say they teach students so i don't think it would be fair um but what what would you say the most absurd experience you've had you've ever had in a prison is uh i'm kind of taking the question in a different direction so i've been working in prison since 1987 every year i go into prison quite a lot um i've had you know i I live in quite a big house. I've had heroin addicts live in my house trying to help them get through this terrible period. And even after all these years, whenever I'm in prison observing these rehearsals and I interact with prisoners, of course, I always learn something. I learn something about myself. Mm. I don't know why, I always learn something. And maybe it's a bit like opera. There's some kind of tune coming out of these ter mostly terrible lives, yeah. terrible, terrible lives, where, you know, there's a statistic that most, that some abnormal number of people, so I don't know, something like 30% of children who go get put in care end up in prison. Hmm. Um, so I don't have, abs I do have a load of absurd stories, I have a load of different stories, but I always learn something from it. In When we were in Bronzefield in March 2020, it was just before lockdown. And it was like probably the last theatre performance to happen before Boris mm -hmm. announced his lockdown. And um, Bronzefield is one of the biggest um, uh, women's prisons. I think it is the biggest women's prison in Europe. And one of the tragedies about, I don't feel sorry for women. I'm not one of those people where everything goes, it's, everything's bad for women. Cause I don't think everything is bad for women. Um, but one of the tragedies of women in prison, I'm going to ask you a question. There are 85,000 people in prison in Britain today. How many do you think are women? 45,000. Five! Oh, you wow. failed! <laughs> you failed! 5,000 are women. So the problem is you have very few women's prisons. So they're locked up a long way from any kind of support network that they've got. Their children are put into care. Then there's a high likelihood that their children will end up in prison because putting a child into care isn't the way forward. Um, but there's nothing else they can do with these children from very chaotic backgrounds. Um, so yeah, Bronzefield is a particularly sad place. And you have this huge um, population of women, some of who've done some very, very serious things. But even though they've done serious things, I'm not there to judge them. And I genuinely do think that it is our role to make these into useful members of society. I say, I want you all to become taxpayers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I think that's, it's an, it's, it's, really important uh and interesting to hear you say that you always learn something um from the people that you meet yes but and well in prison i always meet some yeah. i always learn something but generally i'd say everyone has a story mm. however dreary you think they are everyone has a little story and you just need to find the key and there's a bit of gold in them yeah should we swap jobs if <laughs> you can become the interviewer <laughs> Uh, God. Why, why am I becoming the interviewer? Well, no, finding the story. <laughs> what? Finding the story in people. Finding yeah. the story in people. Everyone has a story. And the, my friend who says that um, was is a Balliol. You're not a Balliol, you're at Trinity, aren't you? Yes, so, we don't like the Balliols. <laughs> okay, so one, a Balliol man who is was has been called the second most um, dangerous man in Britain, <laughs> who was... Um, Jeremy Corbyn's head of communications, Seamus Milne, and when I was at Oxford, I was I sort of hung out with him, and you know this guy's unbelievably clever, has an incredibly interesting life, but he says that he says everyone has a story. Mm. Isn't that a lovely idea? Yeah, lovely, really lovely. And I and maybe that's uh, when we were talking earlier about um, the beauty of opera and how it's a lot of people in in one space experiencing a lot of different emotions in their own way perhaps that's because everyone has their own story so yes. they all relate to it differently correct big thumbs up from me 
Um, so this again, bit of a. a Actually, I'll go theory. back. One, I'm going to go backwards unless you're getting really bored. I'll go backwards. So when you said an absurd story, I hate telling absurd stories about the prisoners because it does make them look absurd. But of course, I'm the absurd person. Um, in in a women's prison, I cannot remember her name, but she behaved extremely badly in a performance and I could hear her, I wasn't, I was sitting in the audience, I could hear her shouting backstage at another prisoner and the next day I went to reprimand her and I said what was all that noise about? She said well her family were in and she was kind of really performing to them and when we've been told we're meant to perform within our four walls and all the rest of it and I said so I said, so, um, um, Sofiana, is your family not coming to see you? And she burst into tears because their families are allowed to come. Mm. And she burst into tears. And I said, so what happened? And then she wanted to tell me her story. And what had happened is that she had one child who was going to come and see, and a sort of pretty grown up child, I think, who was going to come and see her on Christmas Day. And she had, she'd made the cake or the turkey and she had her cards out and he didn't turn up chaotic family these are chaotic families mm. and um in her fury so she you know she never she, he never turned up in her fury she set fire to her christmas cards and was which of course she lives in a flat so you end up with potentially a building going up in smoke which sounds ridiculous but it's a serious offense it's yeah. an arson offense she got taken into prison and then she said, and and she explained the tragedy of, you know, the, the idea of not seeing her child. And then she said, but, you know, um, I'm sure the electric's gone off. So I don't know what's happened to that turkey in the fridge. And my Christmas tree is still in the window. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I tried to organise for the Christmas tree to be taken out of the window, but I couldn't really do anything about the fridge. Yeah. So you just, you know, when you're in prison, you have no contact. You have very little contact with the outside world. So even I'm a help. <laughs> yeah, well, I, the idea of being told off by you, I, I feel so sorry for her. But um, I, speaking of not having a lot of contact with the outside world, I wanted to ask what you think of the way COVID has been handled by the prison service. Well, the, the, so right at the beginning, we left prison and they immediately went into um, a very serious lockdown. So they've got all the staff coming in from, so a prison of 500 prisoners probably has 500 staff, if you count all the shifts and everything, and all the ancillary staff providing meals. So 500 people, they're all living with their families. So every day you're coming in with torrents of coronavirus. This is March, 2020. And people are, the staff are encouraged to, to not to come to work if they think they've got coronavirus. Um, but the only thing they could do with the prisoners was to keep them isolated. Yeah. So this, so I, d I don't know what's being said about the prison service. All I know about is that prison. They ended up very short staffed. And in order to work in a prison, it takes three months to get all your all your approvals done. You're the sort of, uh, I, I, I've lost all my words, I think, because I sipped my gin and tonic too fast. <laughs> um, I, I like laughing yeah. at my own jokes. <laughs> They're excellent jokes. So, so they ended up very short staffed. And because me and my troop had been working there, we all had security clearance. You know, every member of the orchestra, there are 20 people in the orchestra, they've all got security clearance. So I ended up having to go to all my people saying, will anyone take a job in this prison? Because they're desperate for people with security clearance. And so a few of my people went to work there. Amazing. <laughs> So during, so they lost all their livelihood as musicians, but yeah. they managed to become part of the prison service. <laughs> so when you say, how did they deal with it? I think this prison dealt with it very well. And then of course, you've got the additional problem. You've got 500 members of staff going into a prison fight, but you've got visitors. Normally you'd have visitors. There's no way you can have visitors when this is going on, but it's yeah. very difficult for the women, for the men. Yeah. Um, yeah, very isolating, but from the sounds of it, a necessary measure. What do other people say about the prison service? And I think there's, there's there was criticism about how isolation it was for prisoners, and uh, I, I I personally cannot see another way of dealing with this. Yeah, you know, logically, if you've got a highly content uh, virus, you, you know, and you've got these people in a confined space, and they're 
generally not amenable to being told what to do. Yeah, I cannot see another way of dealing with it. Yeah. Well, speaking of COVID, um, is that all, all we ever talk about these days? But um, I wanted to know what you think of hybrid hybrid performances. So, a la the National Theatre's Romeo and Juliet. Uh, you do have you to translate that into English for me? What's yeah, a hybrid so, performance? Um, I, think, I don't know, but you know, I, I keep track of all the opera stuff, but. Well, so uh, like I've got filmed long pointless walks, which is what I do. <laughs> um, filmed theater. So the the stage kind of becomes another character in the play is probably the best way I can describe it. Um, I don't understand. So you just film Romeo and Juliet. Yes, basically. and and the stagecraft, I believe, changes slightly. Yeah, I mean, if you're yeah. so I've done a load of film performances. I filmed. Um, I filmed a load of stuff, but I, the two main things I filmed was Owen Wingrove, which is an opera by Benjamin Britten, which is actually written for television. And I also filmed a short opera by Maurice Ravel, um, which is a, is a 50 minute opera set and it's meant to be set in Spain in a clock shop in probably about the 15th century. So I decide, I know I happen to know someone who's got a very snazzy clock shop in Kensington, Church Street and so we filmed this opera in his clock shop and everyone said my god why hasn't everyone else done that I thought it is so obvious find yourself a clock shop and film your opera but when you so just to explain how it works when I put on an opera you rehearse the opera so that you can run from beginning to end when you film an opera what we do is that we first we record the audio and we did the audio in Wigmore Hall and you don't you don't record the audio in one stretch you say, OK, I divided a 50 minute opera into 39 chunks and I go, we're now going to do chunk 14 and we do it, it probably only lasts a minute. And then uh, we say, was that all right? Let's just fix that. What about that? OK, now let's do it again. And we record it. So we first we do the audio. So we end up with the whole audio. But it's been 50 minutes has been recorded over there. Then what we do in the clock shop is that you play them back their audio and they mine. Yeah. So this is a particular problem with singing because so, but then the director might say, right, the camera is going to be there while you spin around that lamppost. There's not a lamppost in the clock shop, but there's one just outside. <laughs> there's, and, and so, and you're, you're miming this particular piece of music. So you just did the spinning lamppost moment. Then you do the, the moment when the clock, the, the UPS delivery guy, yeah, I've had a, got a Lee UPS delivery. I think he's going to become a regular in all my operas from now on. Anyway, so we so we did it. We filmed it like a film. Yeah. Rather than so doing that is so normally when you film at the theatre or at the opera, you film that way. And I think it always looks very, very flat. The advantage of filming it like this in one minute chunks is that the cameraman can stand anywhere he can walk around them he can he can stand at the he can film from the end of your arm while you flick a hat onto your head so is that what you call hybrid so i think the hybrid is more where you you are in the theater and it happens on stage and then it's filmed and as you said it, it can seem slightly flat so i think that's what um from what i've read these more adapted hybrid versions try to bring like the film. Yeah. Um, so, so you have lots of different views. I'm not just looking at it. You know, you can be in the middle of a drama. It's yeah. like you're standing, you know, the cameraman can stand in the middle. He can have 10 people shouting at each other. Whereas you can't do that in a, in a theater. They all have to line up and face the audience. Hmm. Um, is, is that what a hybrid performance is? I don't, still don't know. I think it's so, weird. I think it's a bit of a mix between the film where you use different camera angles because when they film a hybrid performance, there is no audience. So they don't have to worry about a camera blocking a view. Yeah, exactly. Um, if you film in a clock shop, I swear to God, there's no audience. <laughs> um, there's no room for I love that you know someone who has a fabulous clock shop. Um, uh, yeah, so, so, and actually I was going to ask, uh, the hybrid performances, obviously it's theatre, it's spoken. I was going to ask about how that translates to opera with the singing, but you've already answered that with the... Well, because you can't sing, you know, I can't sing for a whole day. I can't sing anyway, but my singers can't sing for a whole day, but all they do is mine to themselves. 
and yeah. we, we we you know once we've recorded the audio we give them five days to learn how they sang it the first time and make sure they sing it the same way again <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely um okay so again slight pivot but uh you've worked with young people quite a lot um younger than me even uh and I wanted to, to, to ask you if you fear for the arts in this country, given the level of musical education in the state school system. I want you to all read a book by Orlando Figes, F-I-G-E-S, called The Europeans. Yeah. yeah. And it's, 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 he describes how in the 19th century, particularly, the railways knitted Europe together and Europe became one place and European culture then moved from country to country. Britain has, because of the channel, has always been rather isolated in terms of culture. And um, you should see what, or historically it has been, you know, there's mm. Henry Purcell who died in 1695, and there's not really a serious British composer until Benjamin Britten. I'm not a anti-British or anything, but my tutor at Merton, used to say, I said, well, why did this, why does this big hole in British culture happen when Europe's, you know, flourishing and Russia's interacting with Europe? And he said, well, always, Britain has been more interested in hunting, shooting and fishing than in culture. Mm -hmm. And this is exemplified by, in Britain, you have your small townhouse, and you have your great country mansion. In mm. Italy, you have your palazzo in town and you have your casino, your little house in the country. And, you know, we like a little bit of hunting, but it's only a little bit of hunting. Whereas life is really conducted in cities. So when you say, do you fear for the arts? In, I, I mean, also during this period, you know, Angela Merkel, as soon as it happened, she, you know, she immediately gave the arts billions and, you know, German, they're just very cultured countries. Germany, yeah. when, when young, a good young singer in Britain, their idea first job would be in a German theatre. There are many, many German opera houses. There are many Italian opera houses. Germany's got the money, of course, but, here, generally, society at large hasn't ever valued culture very much. Yeah, so it's not so much it's a, a modern development, it's a case of the same old priorities. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. like a bit of hunt. The rich like to hunt and shoot and fish, and that's how they show off. They don't really want to put their money into culture. Mm. And I know, well, of course, flat art um, paintings is a is is an investment and so you know many people say 20 percent of your wealth should be in art yeah because you can sell it on but that's but sort of the idea of economic. just doubling money to make opera happen or theater happen hasn't really happened in britain for ever <laughs> so here's an interesting question i think uh certainly myself and lots of my friends, my family, we've all come to appreciate the joy that theatre, opera, film, TV brings in, in lockdown as entertainment. Do you think COVID in a way might shift priorities at all? What, so that people don't want to go to a live performance? No, so that people do. Uh, do, don't, I don't know. <laughs> Know, you'll still be there I've got I've got to be there anyway I don't know would they shift well I hope people have noticed the difference between watching something on a screen and actually watching some real people um you know singing their guts out and some people scraping away in the orchestra pit um yeah I mean it's different it's the energy that you get from live performance that you don't get on screen but there is a massive amount on screen yeah, I think it's funny because my biggest regret pre-COVID was not going to see, now that COVID has happened, was not going to see more live music. Oh, I see. You see. Yeah. Yeah, je ne regrette rien. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't speak a word of French, so I will just <laughs> nod. Um, okay, well, uh, a couple of questions to, to round up. Um, 
I'm sure they're all bored to death by now. I doubt whether they'll still be watching. Waspy, I don't think you could be boring if you tried. Um, but so speaking of, if you could turn a modern piece of writing into opera, what would it be? A modern piece of writing? Yeah. Um, of course, I'm not going to tell you my answer because I actually want to do it. Okay. Someone will steal my idea. Yeah. It's happened to me before. Never tell people your best idea. I've got a couple of ideas. Sorry. No, that's okay. I will just wait in anticipation. Watch this space. Um, all right. Well, then, my last question for you uh, is if we live and learn, what have you learned? Just what, to... since, what, since I was born in 1956? Yeah, what's, what was what's one piece of advice you'd give to someone like me, 19? Um, well, I think it's brilliant that you're studying classics. I don't think we should study what necessarily what we want to work in. I think that's a one. But whatever you're doing, you just have to work harder than everyone else. And it has to be perfect. And if you don't strive, you know, it's not a case of, well, I'll get away with that. You have to strive for perfection because if you don't, somebody else is somebody like me. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, when you say you live and learn, I'm, I've been very, very lucky. I've had, you know, going to Oxford is, you know, I, I think when I was there, I didn't even realize how lucky I was. I just played away at my violin. Um, but it's, it's an amazing beginning. And so having, with that beginning, it's your duty to become a very, very useful member of society. Mm. And I'm not sure becoming a banker is a useful member of society, <laughs> though I'm highly dependent on them. Uh, well, I, yeah, I think uh, it's interesting that you said you, you didn't necessarily realize how lucky you were when you were at Oxford I think funnily enough the past year of not being there has certainly it's only made me a lot more appreciative of yeah. what Oxford is like um and not just because I'm sick to death of my family <laughs> um but yeah I think lots of us have realized what an incredible yeah. place Oxford is incredible incredible and I mean the quality of teaching and but all you know the the surroundings are amazing but the quality of teaching and you have to devour every moment of teaching because you know I, I actually do regret that there was more teaching that I didn't devour but however in fact having I'm now apparently allowed to go to any lecture I like because I was made a fellow of my college so I can start learning again <laughs> I'll keep an eye out for you in exam <laughs> school um Thank you so much for joining me. It was lovely to have you.